Hello everybody, welcome back. Yet another two population test on a variance. Um, and once more, we're going to be looking at a one tail test. And certainly we'll look at two tail tests and we'll see how to find, uh, you know, how do we determine if it's a one tail or a two tail test. And frankly, it's the same method as any of the exercises we did um, prior to this. There's always little clues in the problem that are going to tell you what type of test it is that you're going to be doing. Now, as we've already seen, both in the introduction to module 11 and in the previous video, when we're doing F-tests, we must always formulate that test statistic so that the test statistic lies in the upper portion of the distribution. That has to do with the limitations that are placed on us when we're using the F-tables, because again, when we're using these F tables, we have both numerator and denominator degrees of freedom. So there's a huge number of variations of this distribution, similar to the T distribution in chi-squared, where we had degrees of freedom determined the variant, but now different combinations of numerator and denominator, so many variants, which means for each variant, very little information for critical values, for probabilities, and note, of course, those are upper tail probabilities, so very little. So anytime we're doing any kind of problem by hand, if we're using the computer, of course, we don't have to worry about this. We can do, we can formulate the test however we see best. But when we're doing it by hand, we have to limit ourselves to making sure that we formulate the test in a way and the test statistic in a way that the test statistic falls in the upper portion. So when I look at our summary data here, I haven't even read the problem yet because honestly, it doesn't matter. When I look at that summary uh, information, I need to make sure that the larger variance goes in the numerator. So I'm going to say this is going to be population one. This is going to be population two. This makes sure that that test statistic is going to fall in the numerator. Uh, sorry, that the test statistic is going to fall in the upper region of the distribution. Okay, let's get into the problem. When seasons change, those living in colder climates need to switch tires on their cars to match the road conditions. So we have winter tires and we have summer tires. Winter tires are made with a different rubber compound that allows them to remain softer in colder temperature and to, to maintain better grip on cold and slippery roads. Although average stopping distance is an important selling point, so too is the variance in stopping distances. Suppose a consumer's digest collects the following data on the two tires. We have the very popular winter tire has been on the market for years, and the second one is a new tire advertised to have a new and improved compound capable of stopping um, at least as quickly, but even more consistently. Okay, it actually sounds like I've got two tests here again. It's advertised as being capable of stopping at least as quickly and even more consistently. Here I've actually got a test on average stopping distance and on variance because it's talking about even more consistently, which is a lower variance and stopping at least as quickly. And so here we're talking about uh, the average stopping distance. Now, if we didn't pick up on that, certainly I can also see develop the appropriate tests, plural. So that's telling me, okay, I've got to be doing two tests here. And certainly I've got a 10% level of significance here for both. So. Let's start off with the test on variance. I'll do a second video to then uh, look at that test on the averages. Okay, so we have our null and our alternative. I have defined population one as the standard tire and population two is the new tire. And here we want to see whether or not we have evidence to show that the new tire is even more consistent, which is to say it has a lower variance than the standard, 
which is the same as saying that the standard has a higher variance than the new. We are doing this at alpha 0.1 level of significance. So again, justify our test. I formulated the test this way so that if the evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, we do have evidence to show that the manufacturers have succeeded at developing a tire that does indeed stop more consistently than the standard. If the evidence supports the null hypotheses, then unfortunately we are unable to make that claim. The variance of stopping distance or the consistency of stopping distance is at least, or I should say, I guess if we're talking about consistency, I should say it's at most the same um, as the standard, if not worse, if not less consistent. Okay, so there we've got our test formulated. Let's go through and calculate our test statistic, p-value, critical value, as the problem here states. Our test statistic for the f-test, always the easiest of the test statistics that we calculate, just the ratio of those two sample, uh, sample variances. So that's 425 squared, because of course I have a standard deviation, 425, 324 squared, so 4.25 over 3.24, both of those squared. This gives me an F statistic of 1.72. Now, what are my degrees of freedom? So here I'm looking at my numerator. I have 24 numerator degrees of freedom and I have 39 denominator degrees of freedom. So that defines the specific distribution that I'm interested in. Now, you can see for this test, I didn't need this information. And that can sometimes be a tricky uh, part of the problem. When you're asked to do a particular test and you're given more information than what is relevant to the test that you're asked to do. Certainly we saw in the previous problem, there was a lot of information there. Again, we did two tests, but in both those tests, there was still some information in that previous problem that we didn't even make use of. It was unnecessary, but certainly it's there to cause some confusion and make sure that you really understand the problem so you know what it is you, you need. Same here, although that average breaking distance, I think we will need that in the next part of this problem, which is, of course, the test on means. But for the test on variance, I have to ignore the information that is not relevant to that particular test. So we have our test statistic, 1.72. I have my degrees of freedom, my numerator degrees of freedom, 24, denominator, 29. So I come down to my tables. Let's see, numerator was 24. I'm going to round that to 25. Denominator was 29. And I'm probably going to have to round that too. Let's see. No, oh, oh, so fast. There we go. So here's my 24, but we're going to round it to 25, and here's 29. So where those come together, that gives us our four critical values. Our test statistic, let's not forget, was 1.72. So here I can see that's roughly in between, somewhere in between those two values. So that gives me an upper tail probability between 0 0.05 and 0.1. Now, this is a one tail test. So that upper tail probability is in fact my p-value. So here I have my p-value for that test is less than 0.1, greater than 0.05. If we use the critical value approach, coming back here, that critical value, well, alpha, no, nope, alpha is not 0.05, alpha is 0.1, so that critical value is 1.64. Okay, so we have our critical at 
24 and 39. Let's write it like this, actually. This will make it a little bit easier because here I can write the level of significance. Here I can write those degrees of freedom. And that was 1.64, uh, if I remember correctly. Good. So that gives us now our rejection region, right? So now I can see I've got this F distribution, some asymmetric distribution here. I've got a critical value of 1.64. That defines that rejection region. Here I have that area in the upper tail equal to 0.1. Our test statistic was 1.72. So that gives me somewhere in this region, 172, which is certainly in our rejection space. And I can see absolutely that that p-value must be something less than 0.1 because as that entire purple area was equal to 0.1, that's which corresponds with our critical value. My p-value, certainly, critical value, p-value approach, always consistent. Often my students ask me which one um, we should be using on exams. Always the p-value approach. And then, of course, when I say that, they say, well, why do you keep teaching us the critical value approach? Yeah, I get it. It's confusing. I, I, don't, I don't instruct, and in these videos, I don't talk about the critical value approach because you might actually use the critical value approach. If you have a different instructor, not me, then maybe they'll, they'll ask you to do that. I always prefer the p-value approach over the critical value approach. I have students practice critical value only because it's good practice, because it forces you to learn how to navigate and to use these distribution tables and it's helpful to understand why those two approaches are always consistent. It gives you a greater understanding of those particular distributions. So using either approach certainly you must always get the same conclusion. Here our level of significance was 0.1 both of those approaches bring us to the conclusion to reject the null hypotheses. Our evidence here supports the alternative, which, as it is stated, means the variance of the standard tire is greater than the variance of the new and improved tire. But I'm not going to word it like that. It's only written like that because of that constraint that we have to have the larger sample variance in the numerator. But to, to interpret this in terms of the problem that we are testing to see if the new tire stops more consistently or the distances are more consistent, I'm going to word my interpretation in the context of the problem. We reject the null hypotheses. We have evidence to show that the new and improved tire is stopping in, in more consistent distances, or the stopping distances is more consistent. Okay, so that completes this first part of the problem. But I'm going to start another video. And certainly now we're going to deal with that other problem. Tests, it was plural. And we're going to look at stopping at least as quickly. Okay, thanks for watching, everybody. Bye-bye.